we're going to be here this morning. We're going to be in the book of Esther. And uh, those of you that was in our Sunday school class that I would teach, I would share with them how to remember some books of the Bible. Esther is the 17th book there in the Old Testament. And how you can remember it up to the, the book of Esther is this. You remember those first five books are GE Lights Never Dim. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those next three books are Joshua, Judges, Ruth. He shouldn't do that. And then the, the ones after that, the next six books are in reverse alphabetical order and then pairs. It is First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and First and Second Chronicles. And then we come to Ezra, Nehemiah, and the book of Esther. If you will, turn with me to the book of Esther. It is the book right before the book of Job. It is that last book of those books of what we call history. Those first five books are the books of the law. And the next um, 12 books are the books of what we call history before we get into those books of poetry. But in the book of Esther that we'll be in this morning, I want you to notice some things that we're going to be talking about this morning. The subject is the sovereignty of God. And that means God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and uh, we are evidence of that. But when you and I begin to think of the sovereignty of God, he is the one that is in control. No matter what you and I may think about the situations in this world today, God is still in control. Now, you and I need to, need to realize the sovereignty of God. And, and one of the lessons I want us to learn this morning is this, that, that we will talk about that God is at work behind the scenes when you and I don't realize it. He's at work right now behind the scenes when you and I don't realize it. One of the things that I have learned through my walk with the Lord over the years is this, that in my, in my prayer life, I have at times had a prayer list that I would be praying fervently for something, and then I would get lose, lose faint heart, and, and I would kind of give up on it. And then all of a sudden, God answers that prayer. He's always at work behind the scenes when you and I don't realize that, okay? And your walk with him and different things that's going on in your life. But as we think about this book this morning, I want you to notice something about the book of Esther. It is made up of 10 chapters, and nowhere in those 10 chapters is God make any promises. There's no prophecy. God's really not mentioned as far as in the book of Esther. Now, you think of the book of Esther, the, of the 66 books that we have in our Holy Scriptures, the book of Esther and the book of Ruth are the only two books that are named after women. And the book of Esther, as we come to the book of Esther, and I know, I know what you're thinking. If you've got a handout right now, it says chapters 2 through 10. I'm not going to read all of those chapters, but we're going to summarize as best we can this morning of the story of Haman and Mordecai. Now, the book of Esther is made up of those 10 chapters, and I want us to know, know some really important facts about Mordecai. And if you would, follow along, because I am going to be as brief as I can and concise as I can be, but I do want you to get this message this morning. It's the great story of Haman and Mordecai. And what happens here in the second chapter of the book of Esther, there in verses 5 through 7, gives us some important facts about this character, Mordecai. I hope it's on the board and you can follow along with us this morning. It says, Now in Shushan, the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Gish, and a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity, which had been carried away with Je Jeconiah, the of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And he brought Hadassus, who is, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when, he, when her father and mother were dead, took her for his own daughter. I want you to notice some things about Mordecai on the way of introduction. You can follow along, and if there will, on the board. He was a Jew, and he was from the tribe of Benjamin. It's important. And because of time, I want you to do me a favor, and, and you can make this promise. You don't have to do it. But at some time during the next week or the next few days, take time and read the ten chapters of the book of Esther. Okay? If you'll read that, you'll follow along and see the importance of some of the things that we're going to talk about this morning. But we know that he was a Jew from the tribe of Benjamin. He also says that he lived in Susa, which was the capital of Persia. Now, this Persia region that we're going to talk about this morning, it's important that you will notice some of the things we'll talk about. Also, he had been taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar. He had been taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar. And the other thing about Mordecai that's important, he acted as a father to Esther. It was his cousin. She was a beautiful woman. She was a beautiful woman, and, and he took her mother and her father had died. And so Mordecai said, I'm going to raise you. I'm going to raise you, Esther. She was a beautiful woman. The name had been changed there. We've seen that Hadassah was her name, but it was changed to Esther. Uh -huh. And it was changed to Esther there for a reason. And we'll see here in just a moment. We see that in, in chapter 2 there, in verse number 10, there was something about Esther. She was a Jew. 
but she didn't want to tell them that she was a Jew. She see, we see in verse number 10 that Esther had, showed, had not showed her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. Uh -huh. He said, don't, don't tell them you're a Jew. There's a reason for that. He said, don't tell them that you're a Jew. We see down at the, in verse number 17 there in chapter number 2 that Esther is chosen to be the queen. It says, and the king loved Esther all, and above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Ashtai. Well, it's important that you and I would notice this as we come to the chapter 2 and we see this, this story begin to take place. Mordecai, the cousin of Esther, raising Esther. Esther has been made queen. She is a Jew which was unheard of. She shouldn't have been, she wouldn't tell them that. Here we see in verses 21 through 23 at the end of chapter 2 where something happens. There is an incident that takes place. Now Mordecai's job there was at the palace was to watch the gate. He was there at the gate. And so what happens is, he says, in those days while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, Bigthan and uh, Teresh, of those who kept the door, were wroth and sought to, to lay hands on the king Asherahs, as Ahasuerus, and the, and the thing was known to Mordecai, who told him uh, to Esther the queen. And Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. And when inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out. Therefore, they were both hanged on a tree, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. This incident is this, that Mordecai overhears two of the chamberlains, and they're going to kill the king. Well, he hears it. He tells Esther. Esther, tell, Esther tells the king. They make a recording of it in the Chronicles, and he saves the king's life, and they hang these two chamberlains. Amen. So what's taking place here is an incident that's going to come back. We notice in chapter number 3, here's the thing I want you to notice is Haman versus Mordecai. There is this rivalry between Haman and Mordecai. It's not really a rivalry on Mordecai's part. It's because Haman hates Mordecai. Why does he hate Mordecai so much? Because Mordecai would not bow down to this Haman. He was a narcissistic leader, kind of second in control there. And what happens is, we see in chapter number 3, notice what happens is, first of all, I want you to notice Haman's hostility. Haman gets mad. He's hostile. He's a, he's a narcissist. He wants everybody to bow down to him. But what happens here in chapter number 3 is, in verse number 5, I want you to read. I'm not going to read all 15 verses, but I want you to notice here in verse number 5. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did he reverence him, then was Haman full of wrath. He was hostile. He was mad. What do you mean you're not going to bow down to me? So he sees Haman is mad at Mordecai and becomes hostile, violent. And he says, you're not going to bow down to me. He was the only one that didn't bow down to him. He wouldn't bow to him. He'd go by him. He didn't bow. He didn't bow down to him because Haman was not a good person. But he said that he was not worthy of the, to be bowed down. Look what it says in verse number 6. It says, and he thought, and he thought, scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Asherahs, even the people of Mordecai. What happens is Haman finds out that he's a Jew. He says, I'm not only going to kill him, I'm going to kill all the Jews. I'm going to kill all the people. I'm going to kill all of you people. Notice Haman's hostility. His hostility grows as he goes and he has a decree there and starting in verse number 12 where he begins to make a decree that he says, Then when were the king's scribes called the thirteenth day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants and the governors that they, they were, they, that were over every province, that the rulers of every people of every province, according to the writing thereof, to every people after their language, in the name of King Azarias, it was written and sealed with the king's ring. He said, King, let's kill all the Jews. Well, the king said, Okay, we'll do it. He makes a decree, and so he does this. So the hostility, I noticed the hostility here in chapter number 3 of the book of Esther, Haman's hostility toward Mordecai. You and I, as we're going to see here in just a few moments, you probably have an enemy. Some of you, maybe young, you don't have them. Just look out. One day you will have what's called an enemy. But Haman's enemy was that of Mordecai because simply he would not bow down to him. He says, I'm not only going to kill you, I'm going to kill all your people. I'm going to have all your people killed. Uh -huh. So it brings us to chapter 4, and we've seen Haman's hostility, but I want you to notice Mordecai's humility. 
Mordecai's humility. We come to chapter 4, those 17 verses there in verse number uh, 1 of chapter 4. It says, when Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the city, the midst of the city, and cried with a loud and bitter cry. You today are wearing pink. Most of you are wearing pink or you've got these bracelets now. That is symbolic that your, your remembrance of those that have had breast cancer and, and different things and uh, recovered and some that have lost that battle. Well, that was much what Mordecai was doing here. In remembrance of all of these, that, this decree that was being put out, he put on sackcloth. It's not pink, but it was sackcloth. And it was something that was done with somebody that was that were struggling. And so what it had, in remembrance, he says that, and he cried with a loud and bitter cry. And it came before the, and he came and came even before the king's gate, for none might enter the king's gate cloth with sackcloth. And in every province, whether so the king's commandment and his decree came, there was a great mourning among the Jews and fasting and weeping and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Now what happens is we see that, that he begins to be humbled. His humility. We saw Haman's hostility. But in the reverse, we see Mordecai's humility. I would tell you this much. I think in the day's time that we live in right now, one of the great things that is missing is humility. In sports figures, political figures, all of them, it's all about me. All about me. I love how they, they'll just point to the back. My name's on the back. Uh -huh. But it's all about them when it should be all about him. Amen. And what happens is this. We see Mordecai, just the opposite of the hostility of Haman, we see Mordecai's humility. Uh -huh. He realizes what has happened. And I notice that he comes to, the, he comes to Esther and he says uh, in, in verse number 7, And Mordecai told him of all that had happened. Uh, Mordecai informs Esther of the plight of the Jews that they're going to be killed. He says they're going to be killed. They're going to kill us. And he said that in verse number 8, he gave him a copy of the writing of the decree in which was given to Shushan to destroy them and show it unto Esther and declare it to her and charge her that she should go unto the king, make supplication unto him and to make a request before him for her people. She did not want to do that. She was reluctant because she could not just go into the king. The king could kill her for that. But she was going to go in there. But I love what it says here in verse number 13 of, of chapter 4. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not of, with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. You're a dead woman as well. He's going to find out you're a Jew and this decree to kill all the Jews, you're in that group. He says you ain't got nothing to lose. So he says in verse number 14, a very familiar, familiar passage of Scripture that a lot of us will quote. He says, for in that, if it all together holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Many, many messages have been preached and taught throughout the years on this verse of Scripture for such a time as this. You and I live in such a time. Amen. For such a time as this. You say, what, what time are we living in? We live in a time much like Haman's hostility. But we live in a time where we need more of Mordecai's humility. Amen. So Mordecai is telling her, he says, you ain't got nothing to lose. And so in verse number 16, notice what happens. Is then, verse 15, then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me. Neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so I will go in unto the king, which is not... Is which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. Amen. I notice that statement as she makes that statement, if I perish, I perish. Uh -huh. You and I need to go with that kind of an attitude. Amen. If they kill me, they kill me. I know in battle, a lot of soldiers have went in. If I perish, I perish, but for the greater cause. And so what happens in verse 17? So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. He did that. But chapter number 5, it brings us to that with the courage of Esther. She goes to the king. She makes it known. She says, I want us to have two banquets. We're going to have two banquets. And so what happens is there in verse number 3 of chapter 5, then said the king unto her, what will, thou, what will thou, Queen Esther, and what is thy request? It shall be given unto thee and half of the kingdom. Uh -huh. And in verse number 4, and Esther answered, if it seemed good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. There's a banquet that's being prepared. We've seen that Haman's hostility in chapter number 3. We've seen Mordecai's humility in chapter 4. 
Verse chapter 5, it brings us to that time where they're going to do this plot. Haman gets so frustrated. Haman is so frustrated. Notice what it says in verse number 9 of chapter 5. Then when Haman forth that day joyful with a glad heart, but when, when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate that he stood not up nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. Here he comes back into the gate. Mordecai doesn't bow down to him. He's infuriated. There again, it's flared back up into him. He's all happy and, 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 and really excited. But then in verse number 14, notice this new plot that Haman has. He goes, he gets mad. Here's what happens when you and I have hostility. What happens is we go to those that we can confide in, don't we? Amen. I call them yes men. I can't stand a yes man. Amen. Somebody that just goes along with a leader that is in the wrong. So what happens is Mordecai says in verse number 14 of chapter 5, then, uh, then said Seresh, his wife, and all his friends unto him, let, the gallows, let a gallows be made 50 cubits high, which is about 70 feet, 75 feet high. And tomorrow speak thou unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go thou in the merrily with the king unto the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. Amen. I want you to notice something. Haman has went and talked to his buddies. He's even got his wife going along. Uh -huh. And they're all saying, yeah, that's what you ought to do. Let's kill him. Let's build this gallows and let's hang him. And they're all just yes men. And they're just going along with what Haman has planned here to kill Mordecai. But what happens in, verse, in chapter number 6 is this. We know that uh, I said that, uh, that Haman's the humility of Mordecai there in chapter number 4. We know that he says in Philippians, and on your hand on its own there, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ. Amen. He took on the form of a servant. Mm -hmm. That was the, the example that you and I are to be. Mm -hmm. But how Haman has gotten so humiliated and how, how that he is so uh, hostile toward Mordecai. In chapter number 6, we notice that Haman is humbled. He gets humbled. And I'm going to tell you something. I love the old song, Don't Get Above Your Raisin. You just wait. When you get all high and mighty and thinking that you're above things and you're in control, the sovereignty of God will put you in your place. Amen. And Haman is humbled. Notice what it says in chapter number 6. I want you to read the first three verses of how Haman is humbled. It says, And on that night could not the king sleep, and he commanded to bring the book of the records of Chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hand on the king Asterus, Asterus, I love East Tennessee names. And the king said, What honor and dignity hath done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servant they, that ministered unto him, There is nothing done for him. Nothing's been done for him. He wasn't recognized. He saved your life. We notice in verse number 11 uh, there in just a moment where Mordecai is being, being humbled but uh, uh, honored, but Haman is getting humbled really quick here. Verse number 4, And the king said, Who is in thy court? Now Haman was coming to the outer court of the king's house to speak unto the king and to hang Mordecai and the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's servant said unto him, Behold, Haman standeth in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. And so Haman come in. And the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man who the king delighteth to honor? Well, Haman here thinks he's talking about him when the king is talking about Mordecai. Mm -hmm. Notice, now Haman thought in his heart, To whom would the king delight to do honor more than myself? Yeah. I think of the episode, it's a colored episode. I do count this one because Barney's in it. But it comes back and Irene Flogg, who's known as Tina Andrews, comes in and he, Barney's on a train. And there's a crowd gathered. And as they, the crowd's gathered, Barney's thinking it's for him. And he's thinking it's for him. And he exits that train, and he's waving to the crowd. And Andy's trying to explain to him it's, no, it's for Tina Andrews, the big star. And Barney's going on like that, and then he finally figures out it's not for him. Uh -huh. Well, I think of that example is really a poor example because none of you got it but me and Doug and maybe Robert and my boys. <laughs> but here's the thing. Haman, Haman thinks he's talking about him. He thinks he's talking about him. He's going to receive honor. He says, yeah, heap it on, brother. Come on. But what happens? Verse number 7, Haman answered the king, For the man whom the king delighteth to honor, 
Let the royal apparel brought, uh, brought which the king uses to wear and the horse that the king rideth upon and the crown royal which is set upon his head. He goes on and on and talking about, here's what we need to do, thinking it's about me. Then in verse number 10, he says, Then the king said to Haman, Make haste and take the apparel and the horse, and thou hast said, and do even so to Mordecai the Jew, that setteth at the king's gate, and let nothing fail that all that, that hath thou hast spoken. Then took Haman the apparel and the horse and arrayed Mordecai and brought him on horseback through the street of the city and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor. Can you imagine? We thought he was hostile there in verse number, uh, chapter number three. Haman is furious at this point. Mm -hmm. Haman is thinking, well, I'm going to get all this treatment. But it's for Mordecai. Mm -hmm. So Haman is he's humbled. But then we see how Mordecai is honored, not hung. That's right. He was being set up to be hung. But here we see Mordecai gets honored. Amen. Those three verses we read just a few moments ago, those first three were the king the sovereignty of God, the lesson here is this. Haman wasn't there that night. Mordecai was not there in the presence of the king when he was trying to sleep. Esther was not there. But the king could not sleep. That's right. He could not sleep. No. That's the sovereignty of God. Amen. He was bringing to remembrance about these two men that had plotted to kill him. And who was that that helped him? Well, he went and referred to the, those chronicles that recorded. It was a gentleman by the name of Mordecai. Amen. And as Mordecai is honored there, we see in verse number 11 when he says, he, then he took the Haman, the apparel, and the horse. He's honored. He's honored, not hung. So when you and I look at this story as it progresses here, I want you to notice in chapter number 7, and those 10 verses of chapter number 7 where we see that Haman is executed. He's executed. So what happens in chapter number 7? So the king and Haman... And Haman came to the banquet with Esther the queen. And the king said unto the Esther on the second day of the banquet of the wine, What is thy petition, Queen Esther? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? And it shall be performed even unto the half of the kingdom. Uh -huh. Then Esther the queen answered and said, If I have favor, found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given, be given me at my petition and my people at my request. He says in verse number 4, For we are sold. I and my people to be destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. But if we have been sold for bondmen and bondwomen, I have held my tongue, although the enemy could not counter countervail the king's damage. Right. Then answered King as as a <laughs> answered and said unto Esther the queen, Who is he, and where is he, that dost presume in his heart to do so? And Esther said, Esther said, The adversary and enemy is the wicked Haman. Can you imagine Haman knowing this is fixing to come down on him? He has went along with building this 70 foot, 75 foot high gallows to hang Mordecai. And this has backfired on him. Amen. So what happens is, he says in verse number 7, And the king arising from the banquet of wine and the wrath went into the palace garden, and Haman stood up to make request for his life to Esther the queen, for he saw that there was an evil determined against him by the king. And Haman, then the king returned out of the palace garden into the place of the banquet of wine, and Haman fallen upon the bed where Esther was. Then said the king, Will he force the queen also before me in thy house? As the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. And Her Herboni, one of the chamberlains, said before the king, Behold also the gallows, 75 foot high, which Haman had made for Mordecai, who had spoken for the king, for good for the king, standeth in the house of Haman. Then the king said, Hang him thereon. Amen. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath pacified. Amen. Look here at what happens. This story has gone in reverse. We've seen the hostility of Haman. He's mad. He hates Mordecai because he just won't bow down to him. Mordecai is humble. All he's ever wanted to do, if you look at the characteristics, if you read this story, how Mordecai helped other people. Amen. And he was humble. But then we see how Haman gets humbled. He gets humbled real quick. And then we see where Mordecai in turn gets honored instead of hung. And then Haman is executed. Uh -huh. And then our last thing I want you to notice with me this tonight or this morning is this. Mordecai is esteemed. We see in chapter 8 and verse number 2. And the king took off his ring and he had taken from Haman and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai upon the house of Haman. Look what it says in chapter 9 and verse number 4. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, 
And his fame went out throughout all the provinces, for this Mordecai waxed greater and greater. And in the last three verses of the, the, the book of Esther, there in chapter number 10, and it says, And the king Ahasuerus laid a tribute upon the land, upon the isles of the sea, and all the acts of his power and all of his might, and the declaration of the greatness of Mordecai, whereunto the king advanced him, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Medea and Persia? Verse number 3 says, For Mordecai the Jew was next unto King Azarias, and a great among the Jews, and accepted in the multitude of his brethren, seeking the wealth of his people, speaking peace to all of his seed. Mordecai is esteemed. Mordecai, Mordecai's motive was not to be put upon a pedestal. That was not his motive. What's the lesson for you and I to realize the sovereignty of God? He is in in the background doing things that you and I don't understand. We don't know what's going on. We don't know what he's doing in some people's lives. Mordecai was esteemed here, and I love the verses of Scripture there in in Psalm, the 75th chapter, there in in, uh, verse number 6 and 7, where it says, For promotion cometh not from neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is the judge, and he putteth down one and setteth up another. You're looking for promotion? Let the sovereignty of God do its part. You and I try to play God way too much. Notice what it says there, and also in Psalm the 147th chapter there, in verse number 6, it said, The Lord lifteth up the meek, he casteth the wicked down to the ground. That's the sovereignty of God. When you and I begin to look at those things in the story of, of Haman and Mordecai, realize the sovereignty of God, that God is in control. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what things is going on in your life, but I can tell you this, most of us have an enemy, much like Mordecai and Haman. Mordecai was in the right. Haman was in the wrong, and he had a hostility toward him and planned to kill him. Here's some lessons I will give you as I'm closing. Here's what I would tell you about this story. You read this story. You get the gist of what the story of the sovereignty of God in the book of Esther is all about. When you're frustrated with how church is going, when you're frustrated with your job, with other things going on in your life, realize that God is at work. He's at work doing things. Our problem is we're so impatient. We want to play God. When he says there uh, in the closing, here's what I would tell you. Here's what you and I need to realize. The opportunities we have are more important than the ones we wish we had. We pray for our, our children all the time. God, open the doors of opportunity. God, for myself, open the doors of opportunity. But the problem is the opportunities we have are more important than the ones we wish we had. We're all looking for those other opportunities. So in the story of Haman and Mordecai, knows what has happened here. He has took this on, thinking that that Haman has got the plan. I'm going to kill him. I'm building the gallows. I've listened to all my yes men and my wife. Worst advice he could have ever got, just like Job. Once he's cursed God and die. Uh-huh. But here we notice the last thing. I'll tell you this. The great lesson here is this. Be careful what you prepare for your enemies. Amen. You and I, the Bible tells us plainly, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Uh-huh. I have so many friends and, and people that have told me in the past, the Bible says vengeance is mine. And they stop. Uh-huh. <laughs> I will get revenge. It's not up to you and I to get revenge. Mordecai did not seek the plateau he reached. He did not seek that. He had the right motives. But the motives was Haman wanted to kill him. Build a gallows, so be careful what you plan or what you prepare for your enemies. He got hung on the very thing he thought he was going to hang Mordecai on. I don't know what you're going through, but I will tell you this much. When you and I are, are dealing with the disappointments... There was this, and, I, and you can write this down. I, I, I'd made some notes as I was trying to finish up, and, and, and I, I'll tell you this. When you're dealing with disappointments, and I can tell you this as pastors right now are struggling with this, with COVID and all these other things going on, trying to get people to come to churches, to set into church houses. It's tough. And when you're dealing with any kind of disappointments, you may be with your work, whatever your walk is in your life, what is going on right now, and you're dealing with some disappointments, know this, the sovereignty of God. He is working in the background. He is working in the background. He's going to send that help in the right time. He's an on-time top of God. That's the sovereignty of God. 
And know, know this, there's comfort in, in, in circumstances, and evil always, evil plans always backfire. I can promise you that. Whatever the evil plans you've got, with God in charge, we've always got courage. Somebody says, I'm just afraid of all these things that's going to happen. Well, I read a great book one time. It was entitled, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living Amen. by Dale Carnegie. And the number one thing was to pray. But the truth of the matter is this, those things and circumstances you and I fret the most about, 99% of them never happen. Never happen. So what would I tell you, the, the, the story today about the Haman and Mordecai is this, that, that you may be going through right now. I, I talked to a gentleman this, just this past week, and I'm wrapping up. But I, I talked to a gentleman this, this past week that talked about bitterness and an unforgiving spirit. And I told him, I said, you know, my problem has been this. I don't have a lot of vices. I really don't. But my problem has been an unforgiving spirit and bitterness and envy and jealousy. That's what my problem has been, the biggest problem I've got. I've got a lot of other problems. <laughs> and you do too. Amen. But I want to tell you this, the sovereignty of God, the key that I want you to understand this morning as we close and we're fixing to leave, is that you understand the sovereignty of God that he is at work when you don't see it. That's right. I don't see it. There's things, if, and I always use, I, I use what's called a little simple, I call it the 15-10 plan. It's actually 1, 5, and 10. Where will I be a year from now, 5 years or 10 years? And what's God going to do? If you was to look back one year ago today, where are you compared to where you were a year ago? The sovereignty of God, you think of all those things. You're talking about it. He's faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful. That word faithful means every single time. Amen. He's not going to let you down. Not just every once in a while, but every single time. Amen. He's on time. I think back of all the blessings that myself and Dawn and, and our boys have had through the years, how quickly things change. Amen. If God doesn't change my mind here in a couple of weeks, I want to share a message with you on what a difference a day makes. Amen. And I want to share that with you. But this morning, if you would stand with me, I'm going to close. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I, I, think that's, I think that's all that God wants me to give you. And I want you to read those 10 chapters of the book of Esther. Understand the sovereignty of God, of how God is in control. All these things you and I are fretting about, all these things going on in the world, the leadership of this world, it's, it's horrible. Amen. It's horrible. We, have, we do not have men and women in leadership positions that are godly people. But you and I's obligation is to pray for them, is to pray for them. Amen. And all these other things, the disease and all these other things that's going on, the disappointment you're dealing with. The sovereignty of God is that he is in control of it. You do your part. Let God do his part. 